So again, so what this basically is, we're doing just raw video feed. Uh, Dan mixes it back in the station for the radio show that airs Saturday at one o'clock in California and in Flagstaff and Prescott at 10 a.m. in uh, in Arizona. Plus all the podcasts are at fightinglineradio.com. You can take this, cut it, mix it, put it on your uh, Paragon's website, whatever you want to. It's it's yours to do afterwards. I'll send you a Dropbox link for that. But that's the background of, of what we're doing here. And oh. we're ready to go. Dan? I'm ready if you're ready. Oh, I got to start it. That's right. Here we go. Every week. <laughs> Welcome to The Firing Line with Philip Damon. The Firing Line radio show is brought to you by Turner's Outdoorsman, IndustryGreetings.com, CCW Safe, Cutting Edge Bullets, Vortex Optics, Vortex, The Force of Optics, and by Philip Naiman and Cornerstone Christian Wealth Management. Good. Bad. I'm the guy with the gun. And now your host, Philip Naiman. Hey folks, welcome to another edition of Firing Line Radio Show. I hope you're having a great day wherever you are. Um, we've had some weather, but I think this weekend we're actually going to be out of it. So that's pretty much a prediction of me being 100% wrong. So whatever you plan to do, um, don't worry, it'll, it'll rain or snow on you because I said it's going to be a good weekend. That's the power I have behind the microphone. Hey, as you know, folks, this show, we talk about the Second Amendment, we talk about hunting, we talk about combatives, we talk about guns, gear, all the great stuff in life, and we try and find interesting people because if you just had to listen to me for an hour, you would all play Jeffrey Epstein in your, in your home. So um, the, the hanging part, just, just the hanging part. So anyway, we're not going to uh, to go through that. I want to bring on my special guest here. This is Brent Brent Dagan, D A G A N, Brent Dagan. He's from California. He's actually from San Luis Obispo. Which, if those of you have never been there, that's like the place in California you want to be. It's a Central Coast. It's beautiful, wine country, uh, lots of wild boar out there. If you want to do some hunting. You've even got fishing right on the coast. It's a it's a pretty nice place. So anyway, Brent, how's your morning going? It's going great, Philip. How about yours? Very good. Hey, so let's let's give a little bit of background on who is Brent and uh, your history, if you will. Sure. Uh, real quick, it's actually Dugan, D-U-G-A-N. Well, why'd you put down Dagan? Ask Dan. I screw up everybody's name. I don't know. I don't know what it's it is. Okay. Um, well... My like background, my name, right? Uh, yeah. So today we're talking about combatives, and of course we went to. So I'll kind of keep it to that realm. Uh, got into like the MMA um, back in high school. I graduated in 05. and as you talked about San Luis Obispo, we had a really healthy MMA scene back then. That's this is where Chuck Adele's from. That's back in his heyday. Um, from there, I went into the Marine Corps, and I got into their the McMatt Marine Corps Martial Arts Program, which is a pretty rudimentary program. You know, they have to base it for base level guys. I have no combative experience at all, but that was still fun. And it was nice using weapons with grappling and fighting and things like that. Um, after I got out of the Marine Corps, I was a deputy sheriff for about 11 years, SWAT guy, sniper element. Um, but during that whole time I was training Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, but ironically, um, I never really put the two together. I spent a long time of my life carrying a gun and a lot of time of my life grappling, but I never really grappled with guns involved too much to really pressure test things and see what things uh, work and don't work. All right. So what was, what was the training that you received in the military for that? So the military, you know, they'll start off, they, they kind of try to do a hodgepodge of different martial arts, things like judo, jujitsu, Krav Maga, Aikido, whatever it is. Um, and so sometimes when we're doing like live grappling, they would introduce like a fake knife or a fake gun or something like this, or we may have a rifle, like a rubber M16, somebody grabs it, how to get loose from that. That's kind of the extent of it as far as fighting with weapons involved. And, and you felt that that was something that you needed. Well, you were, you were on the police department and SWAT team. What about your training there? You know, um, 
in the law enforcement world, um, jujitsu and grappling is just now starting to take somewhat of a hold. Um, I still think that's a huge deficit in training. And it was the same true when I was on the SWAT team. A whole bunch of shooting, a whole bunch of CQB, all this great stuff. Uh, but not really, well, what happens if I'm clearing this tiny room in this tweaker's tra trailer and he grabs a hold of my gun? What do I do besides muz muzzle punch him? You know, so um, really the training. That's what bayonets are for. <laughs> That's right. Uh, so really uh, not much training when it came to um, my time in law enforcement. And as I'm sure you're aware, law enforcement is so undertrained. I think it's every two years post mandates, four years of some sort of handcuffing, um, hands-on techniques, which is obviously laughable and terrible. Well, okay. So that's what post recommends, but if you are putting on the badge and a gun and walking the streets, especially in a lawless place like California, um, what responsibility is that of yours for your training? I know guys say, yeah, well, I'm more trained, let's get paid. And there's that kind of mentality. But, hey, you're the one with the family uh, who's got that job. Uh, what what percentage is it your responsibility? Well, it's, I mean, it falls on you almost 100% to look for that training yourself. However, that doesn't get looked at when it comes to the liability aspect until you see some sort of egregious video where it looks like an ex you know, excessive use of force, which in my mind, it's usually just a lack of knowledge of force. So that way you have to keep escalating that use of force because this person's not going to cuffs. So if you don't know how to handle them, then of course, it's just basically a street fight. So uh, law enforcement officers. The street fights are never pretty. They end up with five, six guys on one. Someone yeah. trying to hold an arm, hold an ankle. Just yeah. it, it doesn't so really, play um, well on video. It doesn't at all. You know, when fights look. Fights look bad anyway. So if you're some citizen sitting on your couch and you've never been in a fight or seen a fight, you don't want to know what it looks like. You've just seen with the movies. So you don't know how chaotic and messy it looks. But to go back to the law enforcement and their training, um, they're grossly undertrained and most guys just don't seek it themselves. They love going to shooting classes. They love doing firearm stuff because they think that can be an answer. They don't really correlate. Oh, this person's not going to be able to take my gun. You know, it's definitely undertrained. Yeah, that's an interesting thing. I, I I believe, well, look, I'm a civilian and I was at these classes. I believe it is our responsibility as free people to make sure that we are trained for the situations. You know, we do a lot of talking on this. We do the uh, CCW Safe podcast uh, with Rob High. And man, we are ringing the training bell all the time because it's so important. People don't understand, especially when you start adding in a stress factor, you know, um, there's there are matches like small local matches wherever you live like an idpa international defensive pistol association or ipsic or they call them lisa out here but uh, lesa there, there's all these different matches you can go to with a firearm and it adds movement and a timer and that's all uh, and people watching and that adds that your level of stress from when you're shooting at the range, making pretty little holes in the target to shooter ready, beep, and all it is is a buzzer, right? But but you watch your performance decline. Well, you watch my performance decline. I should be clear about that. Watch my performance decline all of a sudden uh, horrifically. And so stress-induced situations are really, I think, the edge of training we need to be looking for. How about you? I couldn't agree more. You know, in my jujitsu. Then you're school, correct. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. You know, my jujitsu school, I can do little drills like, okay, I'll have two guys grapple and everybody else is going to watch. And just that, you can see how much different these people react, how stressful they get, how much they're more straining, all this stuff, just from what, having people watch in the gym that they train in every single day. Yeah. By the way, in jujitsu, I am the best flow partner to have. Okay. I just <laughs> easy old man not an issue. We don't want to end up uh, riding an ambulance anywhere. So yeah, I'm, I'm the guy you want. I'm a good Uki. Um, you can beat me up. It's not a problem. We kind of like that. Um, okay. So we've noticed that that's missing. You noticed it was missing in military. You noticed it was missing in the police department training. And that's not to say that it is vacant in all police departments or in all branches of the military, but in general, 
there's a vacancy there. And as we've discussed, it is your responsibility, you being the person who is the first responder. And if you've ever listened to the show, you know that everybody is their own first responder. If you're there, something happens, you are a first responder. You're first on the scene, even if you're the victim, especially if you're the victim. So we have a responsibility for ourselves, for our loved ones, to have a level of competence in defending them. And I think that this combatives area is something that people should really look into. Tell me your thoughts. Couldn't agree more. I tell people all the time, I post on my Instagram, you know, no one is coming. And if they are coming, they're forever away. You know, when I was a deputy sheriff up here in San Luis Obispo County, I worked in the North County region. That's seven, 1,750 King miles. <laughs> King City, just north. That's in Monterey County. But it's 1,750 square miles. And from maybe giving out trade secrets here, but from 2 a.m. until 6.30 a.m., there's one car with two deputies in it to cover all of that. So if I'm 45 minutes away, well, you better help yourself for quite some time. Well, that's 45 minutes away if you're cleared to come right then. You're not engaged Absolutely. in something else. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. 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 Especially people in the rural areas. You know, we've talked about that before, but you have to be self con- self contained, self aware, self protecting. Folks, Philip Naiman, Firing Line Radio Show. We'll be right back here with Brent Dugan, and he's at Paragon BJJSLO.com. Paragon, P A R A G O N, BJJSLO.com. We'll be right back after this. So have you done your Valentine's Day shopping yet? No, I haven't. <laughs> Fair warning, man. The clock's ticking. I know. I know. It's so close. Well, and the wife's birthday is February 1st, so they're so close. Do not treat them the same. <laughs> Trying not to. Yeah. Good advice. <laughs> what are you doing? Wait on me? Okay, here we go. This portion of the firing line is brought to you by Turner's Outdoorsman. All right, you primitive screwheads, listen up. See this? This is my boomstick. Hey, folks, welcome back to Boomstick Radio. Philip Naiman here. Check out our podcast at firinglineradio.com. That's all the audio cast. We're redoing our whole website there. We actually have sponsored discounts listed on the vendor page. So you don't have to try and remember them when I say them too quickly or forget to say them on air. Just go to firinglineradio.com, click on the vendors pages, and we've actually got their discount codes listed right there 15% off. 20% off, a million percent off. It's all there. So um, I think we're giving away um, lifetime lessons at Paragon BJJ in Slowtown today. Is that that what we have down here, Brent? Sounds pretty good. (laughs) Must be present to win. Anyway, uh, (laughs) there's always a catch. Yeah, we gave away um, uh, Fieldcraft. Mike Glover was on and he had some CBD stuff that I wanted as fundraiser. So we gave that away. We give away... Uh, we've done a lot of vortex optics. We've given those away. We've given away McMillan stocks. Just it's, we've got great vendors, a lot of, a lot of cutting edge bullets, uh, and mag light flashlights. So we've got great vendors, folks help them out. Um, go to our website, firinglineradio.com and uh, get a, get a discount, get some great gear. So there you go. So Brent, your background was MMA and slow town. For those of you who don't know, um, us natives call it slow. It stands for San Luis Obispo. Okay. It doesn't mean that things are slow there. It's just what it stands for. There's a college there, wineries, beautiful place. Anyway. So in San Luis Obispo, as you mentioned earlier, there was a huge, um, contingent of MMA fighters coming out of that area. Right. Chuck Liddell, Tim Kennedy, um, all that stuff. So you said you ran into that like in 2005. What was that culture like? Um, yeah, so I started at Slow Kickboxing in 2004, and that's an affiliate of The Pit, which is all those guys you just named. That's where they came out of. Um, the culture was, it was good. It was eye-opening. I was 16 years old at the time, 
And these guys are grown men who are trying to make a living fighting in a cage, especially back then when you're making, you know, hundred bucks in an Indian casino, maybe uh, for your fight. So the scene was rough, um, but it was good. I loved it. I love that gritty walk in the gym. It's got that sweat smell to it. I, I thought it was great. Learned a lot, learned a lot quick, the hard way. Right. But I mean, it was a, um, it was a whole different time. I mean, now it's almost like, well, not that the guys are any are worse, but MMA and UFC has brought it up to a level of professionalism training. It's almost like, a, you know, they're doing Lance Armstrong style uh, scientific training now, as opposed to just lift weight, sweat, die, and bleed uh, back in 2005 with those particular guys. But that's where you started. You got into wrestling also? Uh, just like submission wrestling. And I didn't wrestle in school at all, just in MMA gyms. And so what switched you from kickboxing to jujitsu? I just kind of liked it more, you know, uh, for one, it sucks going home every day with a headache, um, <laughs> from kickboxing, but I just liked it. I liked the, that's just something about it. You know, the, the puzzle trying to figure it out and doing the grappling portion. I just really, um, was driven towards. So you've been doing jujitsu around 20 years then? I took quite a long break a little bit when I was in the Marine Corps. So I would say it's been more around 13 to 14 years of actual solid training. And if somebody says what they hear this all the time, what is jujitsu? And uh, they'll go to YouTube and they'll pull up a match and they see two guys standing in a square and one guy gets down on his fanny and scoots across the thing towards them. What, what is that? Yes. So, well, jujitsu is almost 90% takes place on the ground. So you're trying to control somebody move to a submission. So guys who lack good takedowns or who have a good guard, they sit on their butt and they play guard. Guard is a position where even though you're on bottom, you can be very tricky, very crafty to either do something called a sweep, which means you come on top, or you can be very crafty, different submissions and get somebody in some sort of arm lock, strangle hold, leg locks, something like that. But the um, pull that's called pulling guard when they start off on somebody just sits down and starts off on the bottom in a tournament. It's game right. jujitsu. It's what you do because you're scoring points for your, your team. It's, you know, it's the volleyball version. It's not street jujitsu because if on any of your encounters on the SWAT team, you rolled up on the bad guys, you sat down and scooted your fanny towards them. How's that going to work out? Yeah, not too well. Right. Yeah. If you're on the, we played rugby and in rugby, the rule was if you're on the ground, you are the ground. So you know, you're going to get stomped. You're going to get kicked. You're going to get whatever. It doesn't matter. You should have been on the ground. So when people see that there's a difference between combative or defensive jujitsu and tournament jujitsu, right? That's correct. Yeah. So you see Gordon Ryan, unbelievably talented man, but the game he's playing or what he's demonstrating is a lot of tournament style jujitsu. That's right. Yeah. So anyway, I just want to point that out that that the uh, the original part of it or the part that probably the listeners want to take away is the combatives area. Um, what are some of the highlights? I mean, obviously, jujitsu was started by, well, Brazilian jujitsu was brought to us by the, the Gracies, even though they didn't found it, jujitsu, but they, they brought it to America. Um, but wasn't it one of the, the mantras about a smaller person would be able to defend themselves better using these techniques? Uh, absolutely true. Still true to this day. And then, you know, for instance, I have a 10 year old daughter and she's a tiny 10 year old. She trains all the time. I regularly see her strangle up boys who are much larger than her because once you're on the ground, around her. there's no <laughs> upside. Because once you're on the ground, people think that they're going to have some kind of innate ability or their instincts are going to kick in and they're going to do something good. But somebody just who has a low level of jujitsu training is going to defeat that person because uh, they have a goal in mind. They know what they need to do. They know how they're going to get on top or take the person's back. They actually have a goal rather than just squeezing and hugging like most people do innately. Exactly. And, and it's amazing to me. I mean, you, you have the Jocko Willow links that are talking about this stuff all the time. Uh, and Tim Kennedy, they, they say that jujitsu is their superpower. Um, but it's amazing that if you just had a little bit of training, and I'm talking six months, maybe a year, the difference between somebody with zero, which is what you're probably going to run into on the street and you is substantial as far as your safety is concerned, wouldn't you say? 
I, I absolutely say it. I would say it's, it's almost, it's so hard to describe to somebody because it's almost unbelievable how effective it is with, like you said, about six months of training, you know, they, they don't, they don't believe it until they feel it themselves. Until they get the new guy coming in who, who uh, is trying to throw his weight around and all of a sudden they say, no, nah, this isn't going to work. Yeah, yeah it's true. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so then we're trying to marry this marry defensive tactics, being on point, having good awareness, right? That's the other part of all this, having good awareness, being on point, uh, being a protector, but not everybody plays fair. There are ambush situations, people carry weapons, uh, we should be carrying weapons, defensive weapons, right? So what's kind of the next level here that, that you've seen besides just jujitsu? Well, trying to marry the two. You know, if you're going to be carrying a weapon, then you need to figure out how you can keep that weapon on yourself and actually be able to use it, right? Um, people that carry guns all the time and have never done any type of training of how to retain their gun, they have you know, is, what do you do? Is, is it hard to retain a gun? Extremely hard if if you're not trained, right? You pull it out and you think you're going to shoot, you pull it out of your purse or something like this, and somebody just grabs it from you look, real quick. Look down for your holster or look down for your purse or backpack where the gun is, right? Um, on the police department, it's not really a secret, but you guys have level two, level three retention on your holsters. What exactly is that? So level three, um, so they have what you would see on somebody's holster called the hood, right? A hood is a basically a piece of plastic that goes over the, you know, the back part of the slide there. So when you reach down, your thumb hits that, it makes the hood go forward. And now there's a, it's called an ALS. So there's a little button right by your thumb. So when your natural draw stroke happens, you activate that mechanical button and it releases the gun out of the holster. So, uh, so we, that that's a safari land style, which I think is a great, great uh, method. Your thumb just is right in the right spot, pops it and releases the gun. Um, safari land holsters don't use any retention around the trigger. They use it on the trigger guard on the front end of it. So there's no retention around any of the moving parts on the gun, which is extremely smart. Uh, we don't certainly want to have any kind of a discharge, but if somebody is facing you and they reach forward and they grab your firearm as a police officer, what are their chances of freeing it? If everything is, you're standing there and everything is in there, it's pretty hard to get it out. If you're standing straight on with somebody. Right. If they come around behind you, that's a different thing, but straight, straight on, excuse me, folks, most police departments have holsters that have a security feature in there to defend from somebody reaching over and grabbing a police officer's guns. Those of us in the concealed carry world do not have that. So we're going to talk about that when we come back here with Brent Dugan at uh, Paragon, BJJSLO.com. And I'll talk about why he's on the show today when we come back after this. How's your time doing, bud? Good. Man, this goes quick. You're right. Dan, ready. This portion of the firing line is brought to you by CCW Safe by Philip Naiman and Cornerstone Christian Wealth Management. Spartans, lay down your weapons. Hey folks, welcome back to Mulan Lave Saturday. Philip Naiman here. I hope you're having a great day. I'm here with Brent Dugan. Brent and I became close personal friends a couple of weeks ago. Um, no other way to describe that. When we did a combatives course with Rogue Methods. Now, Raul Martinez had been on the show before. We talked about it. I did say I was going to go ahead and take one of his classes. And I did tell you guys, if you wanted to come beat me up, uh, when to show up. But, you know. Hey, I put it out there, uh, but you were kind enough. People were kind enough not to show up in droves just to womp on me. But we did this rogue methods class. And, and the reason is just like we're talking about in our first couple of sessions here. If you have a firearm or a knife, you're carrying it. You have a responsibility not to lose that thing. Right. Um, in Arizona, they have open carry. So I'm just sitting at a, at a place and a guy walks in and he's got a Beretta PX4 in an open top leather holster behind him here. And he's leaning on the counter talking to somebody. And I saw another guy come in for breakfast and uh, 
he had a literally a flap holster on his thigh. And I'm just, I just don't think people understand. And these are both older guys, right? They don't understand how vulnerable they are when they're carrying a firearm like that. What, what are your thoughts? It's insane. Why would you open carry in the first place? Why would you show what you have, let alone have some kind of terrible retention system, like you just said, right out in the open? Well, so gravity is a good retention system. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. What could happen? Maybe <laughs> what these are, maybe these are actually like prop guns and they want somebody to grab them and they'll, you know, oh, look, that guy had a gun. It wasn't mine. I don't know. I don't know. It, it doesn't make <laughs> sense because I think that bolting one or strapping one on makes them feel more secure but they don't have a real idea of what's out there. You know, I remember years ago, we watched videos from prison, not that I was in prison, but they were actually filmed in prison of the guys on the yard practicing moves that would get them behind a cop. Like they go to be handcuffed, ducking under, swinging back around, coming around behind the officer, being able to grab their pistol from the same position the officer would grab it from, which would release the gun. You know, those guys exist um there there are very very bad bad people out there and you know i conceal carry all the time uh op the only open carry i think i'd ever do is a ruger vaquero 45 long cold slung low slung low on my side right you know a couple <laughs> of spurs that, that's okay but but other than that i don't i don't see your advantage um i think you know we've talked about this before you could be walking down a supermarket you got a 1911 on your back hip locked and cock looks beautiful guy grabs a can of beans off the counter and takes out the back of your head it's his gun right you you had you had it concealed there you wouldn't have been the target for that so not that it happens every day but i believe and i'm not against open carry i think open carry needs to be thought out well in advance if you're going to do it, you know, put on a one point sling with an AR-15, go shopping. I don't care. I don't care, but make sure you don't lose your weapon. I think is what I'm trying to say. So people don't train for this. They don't train for losing a weapon. Who ever thought of such a thing, you know, and, and the time frame. how long does it take? If you and I were together in a room or close proximity and I made a move for you first, I initiated action. How, how, well, do you think you'd be able to draw from concealment and defend with a pistol before somebody was on you? Oh, about a 0% chance that gun's coming out on target. <clears throat> right. And so that that's what we learned. We learned that, hey, man, it's not shooter ready. Beep, it's not like that, especially when, you know, um, action beats reaction. So if you're talking to somebody, you're a police officer, right? The first thing I always say is show me your hands, show me your hands, all that stuff. But, but if that guy decides to just jut on you and he's within five, six feet, there's no way you're clearing a weapon. It's going to be a hands-on, a hands-on. Or if you do, you might get it knocked loose because all you did was get it out of the holster. And now it's even a worse situation. So to learn to fight with a protective bent about protecting your weapon and defending yourself, um, how if how important is that in your mind? It's of the utmost importance. If you're carrying this weapon that's made to do, you know, lethal harm, stop a threat, then how do you not think that if you don't know how to retain it, that that's not going to be used against you? It's I don't think people, carrying, I don't think they realize it. I don't think they realize just how vulnerable somebody is trying to draw from from retention or concealment in a high stress, someone's in your face, punching you in the nose situation. That's right. You know, it's an, it's an ironic thing. They're carrying the gun thinking they're being safer, but actually that introducing that gun by themselves is making them less safe. Yeah. So um, we did a lot of drills. Why don't you talk a little bit about this course with rogue methods? Uh, we did a lot of drills, drills. My hands are still sore. Um, I don't know about you, but my, one hand we know about, but the other hand is still the knuckles are sore on that one. That's the good one. Um, tell us about the drills and, and what you, how you felt about that. 
Um, I like the drills. It was good because um, it's not often that we start with a pistol out and then we allow somebody to get grips on the pistol. And now we need to try to fight loose from that pistol. Um, it's it's eye opening to see if you don't have it in a secured spot by the grips that they show and how you're going to hold it. That's easy for somebody to twist it at least towards you, get that muscle muscle facing you. Um, and then it's difficult to see where you're going to get your muzzle going to be able to get some sort of effective shot on your adversary. Um, so it was great having these drills because that's what you need. That's what we do in jujitsu all the time with the live rolling is you get to pressure test what you're actually, you know, in theory going to do. I think the most, uh, this, this occurred for me when I did the, the sheepdog course uh, last month, but especially again, um, how effective a knife is, right? Um, we see this all the time about why did the, why did the officer, that guy was 10 feet away and he shot the guy with a knife. Yeah. Well, um, there's some drills you can do, right? Get yourself a plastic dummy fighting knife. Uh, what do they do? They, they rub the edges of it with lipstick, right? Don't use your wife's fancy stuff and tell her you're going <laughs> to buy it. Cause if she sees it in your truck, you're in trouble there too. So <laughs> you, you'll be fighting for your life when you get home, <laughs> but you know, the guys will have a white t-shirt on and it's just a striking drill. Stop somebody from just hitting you with the blade because a sharp blade, even a light hit is a cut. And all of a sudden you'll see just how, you look like a tiger stripe. You've got red everywhere. And it is amazing how dangerous knives are. And I think that the public needs to know that because police officers have every right to shoot somebody with a knife or scissors or running with scissors. You should do that too, because that's very dangerous. Um, what was your, I, did you train with knives before? Very little. Um, and after this course, I realized that I would much rather fight somebody who has a gun than a knife, especially if it's some kind of striker fired some out of a pistol where they might get one round off, but I'm going to do some malfunction and that gun's basically out of play until somebody uh, clears that malfunction with the knife. It's in play, man. Oh. And it's, you know. and, and so then you, you do a double hand, right? You, you grab their arm as you're wrestling for it and your hands are on their arm. And then they switch hands and start killing you again. The, the knife was, it, it was, I really think everybody should take that kind of a course just to see how dangerous a knife is. Just so if you're ever on a jury, you can actually say, Oh no, no, no. You know, that somebody's eight feet away with a knife. That's a shooting. That's a shooting scenario. He won't put it down. He's not calm. He's, he's coming at you. You, you shoot till the threat is gone. Um, because that is absolutely the only way to defend yourself. They are sneaky, maneuverable. You know, we even had two people on one, Right. Those, those we did those drills where one guy had a knife, two people tried to disarm him. They all died. They, they, it wasn't even close. I mean, it was so easy to cause the strikes with a knife. Um, it, it was very eye opening. So, folks, if you're ever in a situation, somebody has a knife, you better think safety first. Distance is your distance is your goal. Right. You want to make sure that you're away from them. Um, what were some of the other drills that you had? Well, we're going to take a break here, but what were some of the other drills that, that you thought were worthwhile? Uh, when somebody has their hand on your pistol and an appendix style carry and how to deal with that. Uh, I really like that drill. That's why I carry every day. So really applicable to myself. And uh, yeah, it's great. All right. We're going to talk about that when we come back. Folks, Philip Naiman here with Brent Dugan. Brent Dugan of Paragon BJJ SLO. We both took the Rogue Methods course last week or two weeks ago. We're going to talk about that a little bit more when we come back after this. We might get you out of here just about on time. <laughs> This portion of the firing line is brought to you by Vortex Optics. Vortex, the force of optics. Yes! Great hunter. Yes? Fine figure of a man, yes? Yes? Yes. That is all you need to know for now. Hey folks, welcome back to Firing Line Radio Show. Um, Philip Naiman here with Brent Dugan. Brent of Paragon BJJ in Slowtown, California. Uh, we did the Rogue Methods class with Raul Martinez. Raul is a, well, he's basically based out of Arizona now, but we did a test with, or a course with him in uh, Escondido. He does them in Phoenix, 
he's all over the place. I think he was in Texas last week. But uh, Raul, as he's been on the show before, you know what his, his background is. And we did this combatives class with him, learning retention on concealed weapons, retention on knives, uh, all that other stuff. As we just cut from our last segment here, Brent said one of the best drills he thought was protecting his firearm when somebody else has seen it or put their hand on it while well, it's in appendix mode, appendix carry. Brent, tell us about that. Um, yeah, so we started with somebody's hand and appendix carry. Uh, who knows how you got there, obviously, in whatever scenario it happens, but how to deal with that? Because before this class, you know, I'm obviously a BJJ guy and giving up your back is possibly the right. worst thing. Ever so, so BJJ guy, folks, he's a black belt. He's from the Lovato school. Uh, he's been training for 15 years. Yeah. He's not just a BJJ guy. Um, so when he says this about what's intuitive and, and so forth, it's, it's years and years and years of training, decades of, of training with this guy. So yeah, let's be honest with that part. <laughs> okay. So it's hard to describe the drill. And if anybody has their doubts, they need to uh, take a course with Raul. But anyway, really trying to grab that gun and getting yourself on the ground, giving your back up was very eye-opening to me. Because in jiu-jitsu, it's, well, I would just take his back and strangle him unconscious. Or I'd beat his head in, smash his head into the ground. But what we saw was when you're the person who's trying to take the gun away, it's extremely hard for one to clear that gun underneath the person. Secondly, if you're going to try to strangle me, do you really make a choke? Well, I still have control of my gun. So either I can try to shoot you in the ribs. I can shoot your elbow off once you have me fully locked in. So I'm going to have at least six seconds before I go to sleep, sometimes 10. Um, and secondly, if you try to strike me, you're going to release some of that pressure that you have on me. I'm going to be able to turn towards you and at least get one round off. Um, so I thought that was very eye-opening that we were purposely giving up our backs. But uh, after pressure testing it, it makes great sense because if i stay facing the person then it's almost a tug of war with this gun it is and, and you can't clear it and you can't use it and then the way that you know you're you're just trying to hold it and the other person's stripping it so that motion is going to eventually work in their favor you just can't can't handle that no it was a very interesting thing and like you said um his method was when somebody had their hand or or did it you you shielded your gun with your body dropped to the ground um, and then you had control of your gun. They couldn't get it because your body weight was shielding the gun. You were able to get it, clear it, and then roll, not Raul, roll um, in a tight, you know, you couldn't just be lazy. You had to kind of be in a tight little ball, knees, knees and elbows together and, and rolling underneath the person, which allowed you to shoot them right in the bread basket in the, in, in the sweet kidneys um, or whatever they're called, the hangy down parts it was pretty much where everybody seemed to get shot, but Hey, that's going to get, uh, that's going to get attention. It's going to get somebody going the other direction in a quick fashion. So I highly recommend that. Um, we did have, uh, there was a, a training incident. I don't know if you heard about that, but we did have a training incident at the end of Sunday. Did you know about that? I, I heard, uh, something briefly about it, but I was confused what happened. Well, so folks, if you, uh, if you're going to look at our YouTube page here right now, you'll see uh, this was my left hand while I'm sitting in the emergency room. Um, that finger's not supposed to go that direction. So we were wrestling for the gun. It got caught in something or kicked. Who knows what happened exactly? But uh, this was a, this was kind of a full com combo uh, course. This picture is an X-ray, folks. I know it's radio. It's hard to see. But if you look at your uh, dial on your dashboard very intensely, the pictures will come through. <laughs> All right. So if you're on our YouTube channel, taking a look at it, you'll see this is an x-ray of my left hand. I had what ended up with what's called a volar dislocation, where the bone actually slides below the other bone. Um, looks pretty cool. I mean, the best part about it was that everybody who saw it went, ooh, including the doctor. And I said, hey, you know, doctor, you need to have a little better uh, poker face if, if I can stand through this. You, the doctor shouldn't be going, ooh, but, um, you know, things happen and you just have to work through them. So fortunately, this happened at the end of the day and uh, then it started raining anyway. So I didn't want to be, be there anymore and I had to. But um, 
it, it looks like about a six week, uh, about a six week event before the, the healing happens. So, you know, you're training, things happen. That's why you have insurance. That's why you sign the waivers too. But um, it could have happened on the street, you know, and, and what do you do? You just have to work through it or, or get shot. So anyway, um, what were your main takeaways from this particular training? Would you do it again? Uh, for one, uh, Philip is definitely practicing what he's preaching. This guy wanted to keep going with me with his finger snapped in half at some weird angle. So anyway, kudos to you. Well, I, um, I was holding it in front of you and you were getting sick. So that was a weapon. <laughs> Got squeamish. Uh, uh, the takeaways were what I said before. Um, really, uh, another idea that he kind of said was when we're putting our hand over our gun to protect it is when you get a round off, well, now you've induced a malfunction in the gun, which is kind of good because now that gun's out of play. At least you know what you need to do to clear it to get it back working again. So if the guy gets a hold of it, the bad guy, maybe he doesn't know how to clear it, or at least you know that he's going to have to clear it for a toy. Or he doesn't so know he has to. Yeah. Right. So that was a good takeaway. Second takeaway was uh, – Knives are absolutely terrifying. I want nothing to do with them in a fight. Yeah. And using my body to shield the gun, even if I'm giving up my back. Uh, those are kind of the three biggest things that I really took away. You know, another thing that was interesting, um, we did a lot of close quarter shooting. Not, not a lot of shooting, but what we did was pretty specified. And your hand was almost on the muzzle. Obviously not over the muzzle. That's not how I shot my hand. I didn't shoot my hand, by the way. But, um, but you were around the concussion on that gun and he did the, some drills just to get people comfortable with that that you can have your hand over the slide the gun will go off it's not going to tear you up there's not concussion but one more thing is what if you have a ported barrel if your concealed carry pistol has a ported barrel you could and you have to use some of those techniques because Things have gone south because people have gotten too close and now you have to fight that way. Um, you could be damaging yourself. You could put yourself out of the fight with a, with a ported concealed carry pistol. What, what were your thoughts on that? Absolutely. I never thought about that. I don't carry any ported um, pistols, but it's very true. You know, that, that gas and everything coming out of that thing, it's going to tear up your hand, tear up your clothes, tear your body. But if you have to shoot super close, if you're, you know, indexing off your own ribs or something like that, it's, Probably you should reassess if you're carrying a ported gun for a concealed carry. Yeah, I mean, one of the other, the high retentions we had was was holding the gun up against your chest, against your chest, um, using, your, using your body as a frame. But if your gun was being fired in that manner and you had it ported, it's going off just below your face. You're going to be blowing debris and in, possibly into your eyes or, you know, it. So again, it, it helps... You know, I have a beautiful ported pistol. I didn't bring it, but I, I got this one. I thought, man, that's really nice. And then I was watching that. And I'm like, you know, that that makes perfect sense not to carry that. Don't put that one on your uh, on your CCW uh, list because if you have to use it in a particular manner, it can cause you a lot of damage and maybe make you lose control of the firearm. If you had to pop a round off with your hand over the top and the ported, and because of just the surprise, the heat, the pain, whatever, you dropped your gun, that's that's a really bad day, right? You right. can't run around going. It's true. And it goes to what our theme has been. You got to train. Train with what you're carrying. Actually see if it works or not, right? You think you're carrying around this amazing ported pistol, and then your first training, you realize, oh, this isn't working. But if you never train, then you're going to think it's God's gift to guns and all this stuff. And it's not going to work out in a real life scenario. You know, another thing like this, the SIGs, a lot of guys had SIG 365s there. They had the, the smaller ones and, you know, manipulating those with two hands, it almost was difficult without putting your hand in danger uh, just because of the barrel on that. So anyway, lots of things to think about folks. And all these things come up when you're training right? This is the free stuff. This is how you learn what's going on. And uh, it's much better to pay the price in training than on the street. That's my particular thing. Folks, I want to thank my special guest, Brent Dugan. Brent from Paragon BJJ Slowtown. 
Um, Paragon BJJ SLO.com is our website. Brent, you do owe me a hoodie. I am going to hold you up to that. You can ship it to me now. Um, but thank you. I enjoyed training with you. I enjoyed having you on the show here today. And any parting last words? Thanks so much for having me on. Uh, it's a pleasure. Training was great. Uh, you can follow my Instagram at uh, Paragon underscore BJJ underscore Paso as the handle there for the Instagram. And uh, if you're not training, folks, you're out of your mind. And don't forget Valentine's Day. Yes. Of us. Yeah. Oops. Man. <laughs> <laughs>